seventeen. Test five. You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. You will hear a woman phoning about her membership of a carpool, a type of car sharing organization. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation, and answer questions one to four. Hello, your carpool. How can I help? Oh, hello. Look, I used one of the cars earlier, and I want to complain. I'm not one to make a fuss usually, but this isn't the first time there's been a problem. I'm getting fed up with it. I'm sorry to hear that. Can I take your membership number first? Yes, it's five two double zero one six. Five two double o one six. Is that Julie speaking? Yes, Julie Gold. Hi, Julie. Now let me just check your booking. Your complaint's about the most recent booking, is it? Well, yes, this complaint is. But like I say, it's not the first. Okay, so that was the Fiat. Registration number YPT seven two three S in City Street this morning at ten thirty. Yes, that's it. But no, I think it was the car in Baker Road. My records say City Street. That's the grey Fiat. Oh yes, Baker Road was yesterday. And that booking was fine. Well, yes, that one was. Good. So, what exactly was the problem today then? Now you have some time to look at questions five to ten. Now listen to the rest of the conversation, and answer questions five to ten. Okay, I went to pick the car up, and it wasn't in the parking bay. I was in quite a hurry, and I have to say, it was very stressful. Of course, I thought somebody else still had the car out. Anyway, I was about to phone when I saw the car on the other side of the street, about a hundred meters down. Can't you make it clear to users that they have to park the cars back in the bays? Well, yes, we do. If I had to guess. I'd say that the previous user left it there because the bay was occupied. We'll phone to check and find out, but that's the most likely explanation. But people aren't supposed to be occupying the parking bays, are they? Well, no, but they do. They usually think it's okay to park for a few minutes. Well, in that case, shouldn't members wait until somebody comes back to get their vehicle? I mean, in that situation, I always hoot and keep on hooting. To alert the car owner to the fact I'm there and that I expect them to move, it usually takes only a few minutes. I wish people would show a little more patience. As I say, I'll phone and. There are other things I want to discuss. When I did eventually get to the car, I was shocked at how filthy it was, both inside and out. The wheels and the bottom of the vehicle were covered in mud. Inside, the carpets were muddy too. And the back seat covered in dog hair. 
It's pretty obvious that the last user had driven out to the country to take his dogs out walking. Can't there be some rules about what people can and can't use the cars for? I hear what you're saying, Julie. I think this is a fair point, and I'm very sorry. I certainly will call the previous user to take this up. And make sure that the cars are given a decent valeting every so often. <sighs> right, one more thing. Once I dusted off the seat and found the keys, I expected them to be left under a seat or in the door compartment. I finally started up the engine. I was dismayed to see how low the fuel gauge was. This has been the case before, and it's really annoying. I thought the membership regulations state quite clearly that it's the driver's responsibility to fill up when the gauge goes below the quarter full mark. Am I right? Yes, that is what we say. So, how come I had to sort that out before I could get on with my journey? Look, I think all things considered, we'll compensate you for your experience today. How does that sound, Julie? Are you going to scrap the payment for today's booking? Well, I could do that, but now the booking's on the system, it's complicated. I'd rather offer you complimentary hours. Today's booking was for four hours, so we'll say you have four hours of uncharged usage taken off your next bill. But what if my next booking is for less than four hours? Don't worry. The booking will not be charged, and the remaining amount will automatically go forward to the booking after that. All you have to do is key free hours into the comments option when you make the booking online. OK. I guess I should say thank you, but I'm still very cross. That is the end of section one. Track 18. Now turn to section two. You will hear a man talking to teenagers about archery. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 13. Listen carefully to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 to 13. OK, can you gather round again? Is everyone here? No, we're missing two. Ah, here they come now. Right, the next activity is the last one before lunch. So, archery. And I can tell you this activity is the favourite of a lot of our visitors. It's great fun and very relaxing. It can also be competitive. I think we should get the idea, have some practice, and then introduce a bit of competition, if you're up for it. Good idea? I'm going to start with the basics. Archery is the practice, or art, some might say, of using a bow to propel an arrow. Archery was initially used for hunting and combat an important aspect of warfare in the distant past. Today, archery is largely a recreational activity and sport. The very first bows and arrows, and we're going back thousands of years, were very simple. The bow was straight, but bent into a curve when the string was pulled back. The further back the string was drawn, the greater the tension, and the faster and further the arrow flew. Later, bows were designed to be curved. This meant there was an existing inbuilt tension, and the archer, that's you in a few minutes, exerted less energy drawing back the string. When curved bows were not in use, they were unstrung. That means the string was taken off, so that the bow was not left in a state of tension. I think it's interesting that almost every culture had bows and arrows at some point during their development. Of course, we've all seen Native Americans with bows and arrows in the movies, but the very oldest bows originate from Scandinavia and Northern Europe. 
The use of bows and arrows died out with the invention of firearms, though I must point out that the earliest gunners were far less efficient than an expert archer. Archery as a recreational activity started to become popular not long after that. Anyway, that's enough history. Do go online though if you want to know more. Now you have some time to look at questions fourteen and fifteen. Now listen to the next part of the talk, and answer questions fourteen and fifteen. Right, the practical side. First of all, safety. Now you might have played with bows and arrows when you were kids. But these bows and arrows aren't toys. They're not dangerous if used properly and safely, but they certainly can be dangerous if used carelessly. So everyone, please stand here on this side of the line until I say otherwise. Nobody walks towards the targets until I say it's safe to do so. When I say so, everyone puts down their bow, and then we can all go into the target area. Each of you will fire one at a time. I don't want to see anyone load their bow when it's not their turn. When you've fired, you put your bow down and wait until it's your turn again. Is that clear? Now you have some time to look at questions sixteen to twenty. Now listen to the rest of the talk, and answer questions sixteen to twenty. Let's take a look at the equipment. The bows are fairly heavy. You might be surprised. We'll spend a moment practicing holding the bow properly before we load one up. I'm holding it now in the position in which you'll hold it. The drawstring is here. And again, you might be surprised at the tension. You'll need to practice drawing back the string. Just above the middle of the bow, here is the sight. You look through this as you would with a rifle. Using a bow and arrow without a sight is perfectly possible. Most master archers do this, but having one will certainly help you to start off with. Now I'll put the bow down and show you an arrow. The shafts of our arrows are wooden, but fiberglass arrow shafts are now common too. Traditionally, as I'm sure you'll know, the fletching at the top of the arrow—I mean, not the tip end of the arrow—was made of feathers. We have some arrows with feather fletching, but we also have some with what we call veins. That means the fletching is made of solid plastic. All of you have a quiver with six arrows in it. You should tie the strap of the quiver around your waist, like this. As I've said, you take an arrow from your quiver when I say so, when it's your turn, and not before. Oh, I nearly forgot. Protection. Everyone has a chest guard and hand guard. Like those that I'm wearing, I'll show you how to put the chest guard on in a moment, and a bracer. The bracer is a smaller arm pad that protects the inside of your arm from the string. For those of you in a t-shirt today, that's important. But the bracer will also stop the string catching on the sleeve of a jumper or jacket. Right. So before we pick up the bows. Let's have a look at these chest guards.、Um, so、Track nineteen. Now turn to section three. You will hear a tutor 
giving advice to a student. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 28. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 28. Hi, Leo. What is it you wanted to ask me about? I'm worried about the exams. I don't mean if I pass them or not. I mean about revising. I don't think I know how to revise. I mean, every time I start looking back over my work, I just switch off. I can't concentrate. I don't think you're the first student that ever said that, Leo. Mm. Are you revising at the right time? I mean, are you leaving it until too late at night when you've got no energy left? It's hard to achieve anything when you're exhausted. No, not really. It doesn't seem to make any difference what time it is. Mm. Well, are you worrying too much about the subjects you feel you're not very good at? I mean, are you revising only what you find difficult? Hmm, I guess I am doing that. Isn't that the best approach to revision? Not necessarily. I'd say it's better to revise something you enjoy and something you feel confident about first. Hmm. That'll get you into the swing of things, and then you can go on to more challenging things. Anyway, you have to think about the whole purpose of revision. Is the objective to do as well as you possibly can in your strong subjects... Or to bring your weaker subjects up to an acceptable level. I'm not sure I see the point of revising what I think I'll pass anyway. Uh, but revising a stronger subject might mean getting an A grade rather than a B. Mm. That might be more rewarding and beneficial in the long run. Mm. You might look back and feel a greater sense of pride in getting a couple of A grades than you would about scraping through three or four other subjects. Yes, I see what you're saying. I hadn't thought about it like that before. I'm not saying that that's what you should do. I'm trying to help you see the possibilities. Yes, I see that. Do you think I should accept that there are one or two subjects I'll fail and just forget about them? Oh, I wouldn't want to give you that advice. Mm. I think you should go into each of the exams at least hoping for a pass grade. Mm -hmm. My advice would be to set a time limit on how long you'll spend on each subject. You may want to spend a little longer on the subjects you find most difficult but not an excessive amount of time. Yes, thanks. That's helpful advice. Do you have any more tips about how to go about the actual studying? I mean, how can I keep focused? Well, what sort of learner do you think you are? What do you mean? Well, if you're a visual learner, you like seeing things. From what I know of you, I think you probably are a very visual learner. Huh. So what does that mean in terms of revising? You probably learn best with images or diagrams. You could try organising information into tables or flowcharts. Hmm. I do sometimes make mind maps. Good idea. Huh. I think mind maps can really help you organise your thoughts. And another thing, have you thought about revising with other students? I didn't think that would be a good idea. I mean, if I can't concentrate by myself, <laughs> I certainly wouldn't be able to concentrate when there's another person there to distract me. Now you have some time to look at questions 29 and 30. Now listen to the rest of the conversation and answer questions 29 and 30. Hmm, that probably isn't true. Another person might help you focus. Mm. Lots of students get together with a friend, sometimes in groups. To revise. They usually work out some sort of structured procedure. OK, I'll think about it. I guess with a friend you could test each other. I mean, revise for a while and then take it in turns to ask each other questions. Now you're thinking in the right direction. <laughs> you could also write short summaries or essay introductions, say, and then read and comment on each other's work. Hmm. Both positive and critical comments coming from a peer can be very helpful. 
There are all sorts of collaborative strategies, and apart from anything else, having company is so much nicer than struggling through alone. <laughs> okay, you've given me a lot to think about. Thanks for your time. I feel much more positive than I did. I'm really glad to hear that. Coming to see me in the first place was very sensible. <laughs> Do come back and tell me how things are going in a couple of weeks. That is the. Track 20. Now turn to section 4. You will hear part of a lecture about the film director Alfred Hitchcock. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Listen carefully to the lecture and answer questions 31 to 40. We've been talking about prominent film directors, and today I want to talk about one of the most influential directors of them all, Sir Alfred Hitchcock. I doubt there's anyone here who hasn't seen at least one of his movies. Let me give you some film titles. Put your hand up if you've seen it. Okay. The Birds. Vertigo. Rear Window. The Thirty Nine Steps. Marnie. And of course, the most famous of them all, Psycho. Okay, good. I can see you're all familiar with Hitchcock then. Now people assume that Hitchcock was from America. Perhaps because he spent so much of his life working in Hollywood, but he was in fact born in London in 1899. He didn't actually emigrate until he was 40 years old. Most film critics would agree that Hitchcock had a huge impact on cinema, and you may be surprised to learn that he started making movies as early as the 1920s, when most films were silent. His first attempt. In 1922, actually ended in disaster. The film was ironically called Number Thirteen, and production stopped at a late stage due to financial problems. But before he left Britain in 1939, he'd already made classics like Blackmail, the first film with sound made in Britain, The Man Who Knew Too Much, and The Thirty Nine Steps, and he was considered. Britain's top director. So why was Hitchcock so influential? To start with, he pioneered techniques, especially in the genre of the psychological thriller. He was known as the master of suspense. During a career that spanned more than half a century, Hitchcock created a distinctive, perhaps unique, style. One of his innovations was to use a camera the way a person watching would. This gave filmgoers the sense that they were voyeurs rather than just viewers. He exploited camera angles and used innovative editing techniques to build suspense and maximize anxiety. His eye for detail was astonishing. Did you know that the famous scene in Psycho, in which Marion is murdered in the shower, took a whole week to film? Yes. A scene little more than a minute long. There were around sixty camera positions, and the set had to constantly be deconstructed and reconstructed. 
Today, that kind of almost obsessive perfection simply wouldn't be cost-effective. A week filming one scene would blow the budget. So what were Hitchcock films about, and who were some of his typical characters? It would be wrong to say that Hitchcock made horror movies, suspense movies or psychological thrillers, but not horror. Hitchcock rarely showed acts of violence. The effort went into building up tension, creating a sense of unease. The viewers know that something terrible is going to happen. They don't need to actually see it. Although his stories feature psychopaths, murderers and fugitives on the run, the real strength of his work is the complex examination of his characters. His movies borrow many themes from psychoanalysis, so it's not surprising that his masterpiece is called Psycho. However, a recurring theme in Hitchcock's stories is the twist ending. That's when the story ends in the way viewers least expect it to. I mean, the good guy turns out to be the bad guy, for example. Think of Psycho. It's the element of surprise that makes the end so creepy. Now, Hitchcock's movies feature many other elements of surprise. Daring elements, in fact. Again, I'll refer to Psycho. Marion is the principal character, and it is her that the viewer relates to and empathises with. Marion has stolen money, and the viewer wants to know if she will get away with her crime or be caught and punished. Suddenly, a third of the way into the story, Marion is murdered and the entire dynamic changes. The original storyline is put on hold and a whole new story begins. No longer able to identify with Marion, the viewer begins to empathise with the new principal character. And that, of course, is the murderer, Norman. In this way, Hitchcock manipulates the audience into seeing the story from a whole new perspective. Did you know that Hitchcock played a small part in each of his movies? He always had a cameo role, and this was a very clever move, as it helped him become known. Filmgoers could put a face to the director. Some might even say that before Hitchcock, the director was a far less significant individual in the filmmaking process. Nowadays, however, people go to see a particular director's movie regardless of who's starring in it. That is the end.